Okay, so this evening, what we're going to be looking at specifically are the things Jesus said would happen before 70 AD, okay, before the judgment that he is referring to here would fall upon Israel. There were several indications, several signs that that time was drawing near. And so that's given to us in Matthew 24, uh, verses 4 through 14. Um, so let me go ahead and read that text, and then we'll go ahead and, and look at, um, at these things. Okay. Now, the disciples had just asked the question, remember, um, uh, when will these things happen? That is, when will the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. And by the way, in the King James Version, there's also a variant reading that says, and pestilence, okay? But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved." This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come, okay, the end of the age. All right, so let me just again say in advance that we're looking at this from the perspective of, you know, were these things fulfilled during that time frame? What are the indications? And let's remember as well that, you know, we're talking about some ancient history, I mean, this happened 2,000 years ago, and uh, during a time when there weren't videos and, um, you know, all these different news agencies reporting on it, but there were some who were writing histories. So we don't have a lot of, about it, but we do have actually quite a bit. All right, so again, just kind of getting us up to speed, uh, we, our, our whole purpose behind what we're doing here in the evening is is looking at how we might show others that the Bible is the Word of God, God's self-disclosure, the God who reveals Himself in the creation. And let me just review the arguments we've seen so far. First of all, that the Bible claims to be the Word of God. Remember, if it didn't make that claim, there wouldn't be any sense in trying to prove it, either to ourselves or to others. Uh, and. Um, Okay, so there aren't too many books that actually make that claim, but, Jesus, but the Bible does, okay. Secondly, the God authenticated Jesus who authenticates the Bible. Remember, Jesus did miracles seen by many eyewitnesses. It, those prove that he is God's spokesman. And as a messenger sent from God, he tells us that the Bible is the Word of God. And we saw how he said, really the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, is God's Word. So that, that's the argument that R.C. Sproul gave us, and what we're doing is trying to fill that out just a little bit. And as I mentioned, that among all the books that claim to be from God, and there really aren't that many, only the Bible reveals the God we see in the creation. Uh, that's why we started with the creation. We looked at natural revelation, we saw what it reveals about God, and, and then when we compare the God we see in nature with the God we see revealed in these different books, we find that really only the Bible shows us that same God. Now currently, we're looking at fulfilled prophecy as further evidence the Bible is the Word of God, because we know from the creation, remember, that God is infinite. He must be infinite. There can't be a place where there's nothing. So He must exist everywhere. Now, if he is 
infinite, that means that everything he possesses is also infinite. Otherwise, he wouldn't be infinite, right? If he had finite knowledge, he wouldn't be an infinite God. So being infinite and being really, um, well, being infinite, I should say only a being that has infinite knowledge can tell us what's going to happen in the future. Also, of course, one who's absolutely sovereign. Well, the Bible contains many predictions that were given long before they came to pass, and they came to pass exactly as they, as well as, as the prophets said they would, as God said they would, showing, again, another way of showing that the Bible is His Word. And we've looked at a couple of examples, and we're looking at the third example right now. The first example was God said through Ezekiel in 586 B.C., that many nations were going to come against Tyre with the result that the city was going to be scraped off the coast, I mean, actually leveled to the ground and cast into the sea. And many nations did come against Tyre, and it was leveled to the ground and scraped off and cast into the sea, and that took place by 332 B.C. That's uh, over 200 years later, okay, exactly as the Lord said it would. Remember, we, He said through Daniel that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah the Prince would be 69 weeks of years, which is 483 years, and that he would die three and a half years later in the middle of the 70th week, putting an end to the sacrificial system, okay? Now, that decree was issued in 457 B.C. by Artaxerxes of Persia, Jesus' ministry began around 26, 27 A.D., which is 483 years later, and His ministry lasted for three and a half years, at the end of which He was crucified, putting an end to the sacrificial system, just exactly as God said it would take place. And in conjunction with that, we saw several other prophecies that had to do with Jesus, you know, where He would be born, uh, how He would die, and we saw that they were fulfilled precisely as God said they would. Now, currently, we're looking at Jesus' prediction in the Olivet Discourse that the temple would be destroyed in 70 A.D. Now, let me just remind you, last time we saw four reasons that Jesus must have been speaking about 70 A.D., the temple that then existed that was going to be destroyed, okay? First of all, because of the target audience, because of who it was he was speaking to, and because of what it is he had just said. Remember that in Matthew 23, which comes just before Matthew 24, Jesus had been speaking in the temple, and he had been teaching, uh, you know, the Jews and the leaders of Israel were listening to him and challenging him, and the culmination of their discussion was that Jesus pronounced eight woes on the leaders of Israel. And he said that he would charge that generation then living with all the guilt of the righteous, of all the righteous blood shed on earth. He said it would be charged to that generation. Now, the Olivet Discourse is all about that judgment, okay? That's, as a matter of fact, at the end of 23, Jesus and his disciples leave the temple, and that's when the disciples draw Jesus' attention to the temple and ask Him the questions which He answers, okay? So the Olivet Discourse is about the judgment Jesus had just pronounced upon that generation for their rejection of the Messiah. You know, they had the greatest privilege. God fulfilled the promises He had made throughout the entire Old Testament in their generation. They saw Jesus, they saw His miracles, uh, and they rejected Him. That's why um, judgment was going to be so severe upon them. Secondly, because of the questions that Jesus was answering in this discourse, um, the disciples pointed, you know, to, to the temple buildings, and Jesus said, you see all these things, they're going to be torn down. The disciples asked, when is that going to happen? Okay, when is this temple, this temple, the one we're pointing to right here, when is this one going to be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming? Because Jesus had talked about the fact that He was coming in judgment. What's going to be the sign of that? And of the end of the age, 
And I would submit to you what he meant by that is the Jewish age, okay? Well, Jesus is answering those questions in the Olivet Discourse where those things, you know, that actually did take place in 70 AD, he's telling them about the things that are going to happen, the signs that it's about to happen, what happens when it takes place, and what's going to happen immediately after that. Now, thirdly, because of all the warnings he gives in this discourse, he is giving them to his disciples. Uh, he is warning them of what is going to happen because these things were going to affect them. They were going to see the fulfillment of these things. So that's why he was warning them. So again, it shows us that it had relevance to them because it was going to happen within the generation then living. And fourthly, again, because Jesus gave us the clear time frame uh, in which all the things he was speaking about in Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse would take place. He says in verse 34, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Jesus was saying those living at that time, the time he made this prediction, would not all die until all these things he was speaking of took place. Now, he said these things in 30 AD, and they happened in 70 AD, which in the Jewish mind was in the time frame of one generation, okay? So they happened within that generation. That generation would not pass away until all these things take place. So this evening, what we're going to consider are the really five signs that Jesus gives that the judgment was coming, okay? When are these things going to be, happen? What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus, first of all, tells them what's going to happen just prior, okay? Now, the first sign would be the rise of false Christs and prophets. He says in verses 4 and 5, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. And he says in verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. So there's going to be these false leaders, these false prophets. Now, I think we shouldn't understand Jesus necessarily speaking of Christ in the way that we think of Christ because we understand that properly, what Messiah was coming to do, which was, as we saw this morning, to take the curse upon himself and deliver us from the curse we were born under. But the Jews would have understood these Christs as those who were political, military leaders who would deliver them from Rome. And such people like that actually did arise during that time frame. Josephus, remember the one who chronicled the destruction of Jerusalem. He was a Jewish historian, actually I believe a um, Jewish general who was, um, his, his regiment was captured by the, uh, the Romans and he was actually looked at as a traitor by his own people, even though he wasn't. He was trying to preserve the temple. He was trying to preserve Jerusalem. Uh, but at the same time, he was writing the history of this while he was, again, you know, captured by the, the Romans. But he lived during the time of Jerusalem's fall. And he wrote that around this time, there were many deceivers and impostors who, under the pretense of divine inspiration, fostered revolutionary changes. In other words, they were encouraging revolution or war against, um, against the Roman dominion, okay? So again, Christ being raised up uh, to fight against Rome. He also wrote about the Egyptian false prophet who had his base of operations at the Mount of Olives. I believe we read about him also uh, in... Um, See, was it, um, I think it was the book of Acts. Justin Martyr, one of the early apologists for the Christian faith, wrote in his first apology, after Christ's ascension into heaven, the devils put forth uh, or put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods. Okay, so again, false prophets, false leaders trying to lead people astray. During the siege of Jerusalem, there were false prophets within the city. Uh, and in their prophecies caused many to die uh, at the end of the siege. I think they 
uh, they, they counseled the people to do one thing that actually led to their being killed by the Romans. Okay, so Jesus tells us that there would be false Christs and false prophets around this time, and their deception would be so powerful that many people would follow them. The disciples could know that his judgment was near when they saw these false Christs, these false leaders, and these false prophets. Now, the second sign would be wars, food shortages, seismic activity, okay? He says in verses 7 and 8, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now, that he mentions war is significant because Jesus said this during the time of what's called the, the Pax Romana, which is the, the peace of Rome. Uh, Origen, who was one of the early church fathers, tells us that there was an abundance of peace that began, interestingly enough, at the birth of Christ. You know, you think about what the angels said, you know, when Christ was born, peace on earth, uh, goodwill towards men among whom, you know, uh, the Lord is pleased. That, you know, there was certainly the peace that he was coming to bring between God and man. He was the one who would be the reconciler. But uh, Origen points to this as the time that the, the Pax Romana actually began. And it, it was brought about by Rome's dominion. Uh, they had conquered essentially the entire world. And um, uh, so having control of the world, they were able to establish peace. There wasn't, uh, you know, war going on at least during that time. Now, this is what allowed the gospel to spread so quickly because with this dominion and this peace and the Roman road that was throughout the empire, uh, travel was quite easy and they were able to get around. And this... This uh, Pax Romana didn't actually end until Nero died in 68 AD. Now, Tacitus, a Roman historian who was about 15 years old when Rome, was attacked, uh, when Rome attacked Jerusalem, wrote that in the year 68, 69 AD, this peace was ruptured by the outbreak of the Jewish War and the Roman civil wars in what was called the violent year of four emperors. So there was war against the Jews, and I believe the Caesar had died that was in power, it was Nero. And so there was this civil war going on, everyone was making a play to become the next Caesar. So it was called uh, the violent year of four emperors. So there was war, rumors of war. There are accounts of famines and earthquakes and even plagues. Remember a variant I told you was in the King James Version by secular historians of the time. Luke tells us in the gospel, or excuse me, in the book of Acts, of one famine that Agabus predicted that took place during the reign of Claudius, who reigned from 41 to 54 AD. This may have been the same famine that took place in Jerusalem after the death of Herod Agrippa in 44 AD that Josephus writes about in his Antiquity of the Jews, in which Many people died. Suetonius, a Roman historian born in 69 AD, writes that during the reign of Nero from 54 to 68 AD, a great plague broke out that killed 30,000 in a single autumn. By the way, you're not going to be able to write all this down. This is <laughs> quite a bit of information. Tacitus, in his annals, writing about this plague or possibly another plague during Nero's reign says this, quote, a year of shame and of so many evil deeds, heaven also marked by storms and pestilence. Campania was devastated by a hurricane which destroyed everywhere country houses, plantations and crops and carried its fury to the neighborhood of Rome where a terrible plague was sweeping away all classes of human beings without any such derangement of the atmosphere as to be visibly apparent. Yet the houses were filled with lifeless forms and the streets with funerals. He also writes of a terrible earthquake that took place during the reign of Tiberius from 14 to 37 AD. That's when Tiberius reigned. Uh, 
quote, that same year, 12 famous cities of Asia fell by an earthquake in the night so that the destruction was all the more unforeseen and fearful. Nor was there the means of escape usual in such a disaster by rushing out into the open country, for their people were swallowed up by the yawning earth. Vast mountains, it is said, collapsed. What had been level ground seemed to be raised aloft, and fires blazed out amid the ruin. The calamity fell most fatally on the inhabitants of Sardis, and it attracted to them the largest share of sympathy. During the year of, of Claudius and his wife Agrippina, uh, which was from 49 to 54 AD, Tacitus writes, quote, several prodigies or wonders occurred in that year. Birds of evil omen perched on the capital, houses were thrown down by frequent shocks of earthquake, and as the panic spread, all the weak were trodden down in the hurry and confusion of the crowd. Scanty crops, too and consequent famine were regarded as a token of calamity. Now again, you know, Jesus said there would be wars, there would be famines, there would be earthquakes, pestilence before his coming in judgment on Jerusalem, and so it happened. By the way, these are just a few of the, of the accounts of the things that did take place. Now the third sign Jesus pointed to would be persecution, and I think we, we understand that took place. Verses 9 and 10, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Uh, okay, so some would be killed, all would be hated, some would fall away and betray their brothers and sisters in Christ because of the persecution. Now, it almost seems, Jesus almost seems to be referring to maybe the time closer to when 70 AD takes place and the persecution is taking, you know, is, is already launched against Jerusalem. But we do know in the book of Acts that covers the time frame from the ascension of Christ in chapter 1, uh, to, which is uh, around 30 AD, to the time of the first Roman imprisonment of Paul in 62 AD. Okay, that's the time frame that Jesus is speaking about in the Olivet Discourse from 30 to, to 70, so it falls in that time frame. This was also the time when God was gathering His people from the Jews who were dispersed throughout the entire Roman Empire before he brings judgment on them for their rejection and crucifixion of the son. Basically, all the Jews needed the opportunity to hear that that promise had been fulfilled um, and either to receive him or reject him. Uh, so um, they got that opportunity, but it gives us several accounts of the persecution that the early church had to endure as Christianity continued to spread across the empire. Now, they were hated. Paul was stoned to death on one occasion. Um, we, we read in the book of Acts that there were, you know, people were dragged before the, um, uh, before the magistrates and so forth. There was persecution, there was hatred, but particularly as we move towards 70 AD, uh, as, you know, God's judgment is falling upon Jerusalem and tensions begin to rise. So there would be persecution and death and hatred. The fourth sign, which is really the cause of all of this, would be greater wickedness and the loss of natural affection. Verse 12, and because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Again, we've just seen that in the persecution, but the cause behind this is ultimately the Lord's withdrawing His Spirit loosening his restraint on man's heart, which is one part of God's judgment that would cause the natural affection that people typically had for one another uh, to dissipate. Now, fifthly, though not necessarily a sign, Jesus says this in verse 13, the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, he already said that many of them are going to be killed by this persecution, hated and killed and so forth. Uh, 
So he's not necessarily saying here that if you persevere through all these difficulties, you're going to save your lives. You know, he's already said many of them are going to die. But what he's saying here is most likely if you endure and, you know, um, hold fast to me, your, your souls will be saved, okay? If they persevere through the persecution by holding fast to him and his gospel, God would make sure, Christ would make sure that they arrived safely in heaven. So Jesus is warning him, difficult times are coming. But if you endure through these difficulties, you will be safe. Now, the only way they could do that is the way that Paul did. You know, I mean, remember, how did Paul, how is it he was able to risk his life on so many occasions, even, you know, the floggings, the stonings, the, the beatings, the, the, you know, the whole catalog of things he gives to us in 2 Corinthians. How could he endure these things? Because that's, that's what Jesus is saying all his disciples would have to endure. Well, he was able to do it because he was convinced, first of all, that heaven is better than earth, okay? To depart and to be with Christ is very much better. Secondly, he knew because of Jesus' promise that if he were to die, he would be with the Lord. So worst thing that can happen to me is they'll kill me and I get to go to a much better place. And then thirdly, of course, asking for the Lord for the continual strength to endure day by day the things that he had to endure through his promise and the hope that he had of heaven. I just bring that up to say that, you know, I think it's something we saw recently that R.C. was talking about in one of the videos. That's how we're going to find the strength also to endure the things we have to endure, the hatred of others against us for holding to the gospel. You know, no one's going to hate us if we hide in a closet and never talk to anybody about Christ. They're not going to hate you for that. If you blend in with everybody else, they're not going to hate you for that. But if you tell them about Christ and if you point out that things they're doing are wrong and they need to turn from those things and turn to Christ, well, then they may not like you so much, okay? So how can we, how can we do that? Well, again, knowing that their lives are on the line, their souls are on the line, knowing that this is what Christ has called us to do, knowing that even if they attack us, there is a much better hope that we have uh, in heaven. Okay, but then there was one last thing Jesus said would take place before the judgment came. He says in verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, think about this for a minute, okay? Right now, we're still sending out missionaries, right? We're, we're still, there's still lots of ground to break out there. There are still hundreds if not thousands of people groups that have not been reached with the gospel, right? I mean, people that speak a language that they don't have a gospel witness in their language. Now, that is the reason why so many think that Jesus in this Olivet Discourse must have been speaking about his coming at the end of time in the second coming, okay? But let's look at an alternate way of viewing this. Let's not forget how the original audience would have understood what Jesus was saying. They would have understood the whole world and all the nations differently than we understand it, okay? To them, that was the Roman Empire. Now, listen to how Luke describes the Roman Empire at the time of Augustus in Luke 2, verse 1. He says, now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now, what did he mean by that? Was he talking about South America and uh, maybe the tip of Africa? No, he was talking about everything under the dominion of the Roman Empire because that was the only thing that they had authority over. The Jews of Thessalonica uh, used a similar phrase when they accused the Christians before the city authorities for preaching the gospel in Acts 17, verse 6. Okay, so it says, when they did not find them, that is Paul and Silas, they were looking for these troublemakers who came, you know, came to Thessalonica who were stirring up so much trouble. 
When they could not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Now, they've upset the world. What, what were they talking about? They were talking about the Roman Empire. Okay? That was the world at that time. When Jesus said the gospel would be preached in the whole world to all the nations, he was referring to the nations subsumed under Roman rule, where God's covenant people, the Jews, lived, that he might, again, gather his elect from all the Jews before he brought judgment and overthrew the old covenant Jewish system. Now, Paul tells us that was actually fulfilled before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the entire Roman Empire had been reached by the gospel. He and his companions had uh, evangelized uh, very strategically, not by going to each and every town and village that existed everywhere, but rather going to the major cities and making sure there was a, uh, you know, in a place of, of uh, you know, metropolitan centers where people would come through, that there were churches planted that would come in contact with the people who were going out. It's kind of like how the Lord did it on the day of Pentecost. All the Jews were gathered in Jerusalem. Uh, not all the Jews, but you know, the, the, the men at least uh, were there who, who were adults. And they heard the sound and Peter had this huge crowd and he preached and, and then they were discipled and they were sent out and they planted churches everywhere they went. So Paul did the same thing, planting churches in major metropolitan centers going as far as Spain in his lifetime. But even during the time of his ministry, he says this in his letter to the Colossians. He thanks God that when the gospel came to them, they received it, Colossians 1, 6, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. And then he says in chapter 1, verse 23, he encourages them to hold on to the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. When he writes to the church at Rome, he says this in, in chapter 1, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And then in his closing doxology in chapter 16, verses 25 through 27 in the book of Romans, he says this, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. So notice Jesus said this gospel, the, the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations before the end would come. Paul tells us that even during his lifetime and ministry, that that had taken place. So Jesus said that these were the signs that the destruction of Jerusalem was drawing near. Okay? And again, before God brings judgment on Jerusalem, he makes sure that all the Jews in the Roman Empire get a chance to hear the gospel and either receive or reject Christ before it happens. And we also know that um, uh, they were passing along what Jesus had to say about what was coming in the Olivet Discourse. You know, those who believed and embraced Jesus Christ made sure that they were out of danger's way when God's judgment finally did fall on Jerusalem. That's the reason why Jesus was addressing his disciples and said, you be ready when this takes place. So next time we're going to look at the sign that the judgment had come and what was going to happen when it came. Okay, so we'll, we'll end here uh, for this evening. So let's just, uh, again, um, well, okay, it's, it's a lecture, so not, not really too much by way of application.
except the whole purpose behind this, again, remember, is, is simply this, that um, Jesus made a prediction, and these things came to pass exactly as Jesus said they would. Okay, so we, we have a clear example of a prediction clearly before the event with amazing detail. It happens exactly as Jesus said it would, and we're, we're going to look at, at more of that um, next time. So why don't we, though, at this point, um, let's sing a hymn.